All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know many of you have been joining us all month long, but if you are new to this, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And what a month it has been. This marks our penultimate, our second last broadcast of the entire month. Uh, we started out with this plan that we were gonna do a few in September. We were gonna take it easy, be very casual. And I think by the end of today, it'll be 53 or 54 broadcasts in 17 days, which is a little insane, but we've had a lot of fun. If you've joined us for the Week of Wonder, for Marine Plastics, for all sorts of great programs, it's been such a thrill having you. I know for many of you, it's your first month back in the classroom with students, and so bravo to you. It's been the weirdest year to be a teacher or student ever, and I'm so glad you've enjoyed joining us as we showcase such amazing people and places around the world. Now, I'm always jazzed about broadcasts. I have the coolest job in the world. But today is particularly special because we are bringing back George Crudis for the first time this year, one of my all-time favorite speakers, someone who was involved in the very origins of exploring by the seat of your pants, and quite possibly the world's coolest adventurer and explorer. I mean, it's just it's the best job of all time. You know what? I'm going to bring him in. We can chat for a second. More. <laughs> George, it's so nice to have you back, man. Glasses off. We're ready to dive in. Epic adventures galore. Oh, Absolutely. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, new school year and all. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to get invited to come and uh, do a exploring by the seat of your pants session. Our pleasure anytime. And honestly, kids have been the most excited they've ever been this year. So you're in for a treat when we dive in with a Q&A. But before we dive in with your talk, and I'll tell you what everyone the topic is, we are doing our first Kahoot quiz with George. So some of you teachers might know this. If you guys want to head to Kahoot.it with the game pin 962354, before we dive in with questions, we're going to do a quiz on some world's weirdest weather today. So check that out. I will bring up that game pin at the end of George's talk as well, but get ready with your devices at home. So, and I have not seen these questions. I know. No, he has no idea. So it could be anything. You're going to find it together. I got to create these this morning. Uh, so guys, we're going to dive in. George has joined us for, I think, 20, 30 broadcasts in the past. We've done hurricanes. We've done volcanoes. We've done all sorts of amazing things. Thunder and lightning was one of my favorite talks ever in the history of our program with a thousand broadcasts under my belt. So super, super cool stuff. Today, we're going to dive in on the world's weirdest weather. Do frogs actually fall from the sky? Are there fire tornadoes? Can acid rain burn your skin? All these amazing things we're going to dive in because George is the ultimate tour guide to this on the planet. He has been to all these places. He's been all over the world many, many times to explore the world's most amazing natural phenomena. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you, man, to blow our minds and take us away. Thank you so much for joining us and let's dive in. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Jesse, my friend. Welcome everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I am an explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. I'm the Canadian uh, chairman of the Explorers Club and I'm also a National Geographic Explorer, and I specialize in documenting extreme forces of nature and natural disasters. And so what I've got for you today is, well, some of the weirdest weather on Earth. Let me just get my screen going here, and there we go. Is that working, Jess? That is perfect. You're good to go, man. Cool, so world's weirdest weather. So, of course, weather can be weird and i specialize in things like um documenting weather for television programs i do a lot of that I do, I do a lot of scientific work but i also do a lot of television work so you may recognize me from angry planet or strange evidence or what on earth on science channel or the storm hunters on on the weather network and um, and i really love when weather gets unusual those those moments that really when you see something it's like that's really odd so I'm talking odder than tornadoes, and I've chased tornadoes all over North America. I've seen well over 100 of them. Weirder than hurricanes, been in lots of hurricanes, including Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, weirder than lightning. I don't, I'm not sure how many uh, viewers we have from Toronto, but uh, this is the CN Tower in Toronto here where, where I live. And uh, it gets struck by lightning about 70 to 100 times per year. And sometimes you get these lightning bolts that come off the top of the tower. But that's not even weird enough to qualify uh, for the kind of stuff that we're talking about today. So let's get weird. Now, I'm going to cover, I think, yeah, four different types of weird weather. And you're probably wondering, why is there a picture of a volcano on the screen? Well, I do a lot of volcano expeditions all over the world in places like Congo and the South Pacific and Iceland. But there's some weird stuff that happens with volcanoes. You can actually have volcanoes affecting the weather around them in some bizarre ways. 
And that's going to be our first stop today on our Weird Weather World Tour. So this particular volcano, which I've talked about many times in the past on these uh, presentations, but today we're taking a slightly different angle. It's uh, in the South Pacific in the nation of Vanuatu, which is, oh, about a thousand kilometers or so east of Australia. And one thing that happens is you've got this boiling lava, but the lava is boiling because all of these gases from the center of the earth are percolating and bubbling up through it. So you've got, uh, there's water vapor, there is sulfur dioxide, there is hydrogen sulfide, all of these really toxic, nauseous gases. And as they percol up, percolate up and, and go into the atmosphere, some weird stuff starts to happen. We get acid rain because if you've got a rain cloud and the raindrops fall through that cloud of sulfurous gas, the raindrops pick up some of that sulfur and it literally turns into sulfuric acid. And the sources of these gases, sometimes they come from volcanoes, sometimes it comes from factories and industry, but this acidic rain can have quite dramatic effects on the landscape. For example, it can absolutely destroy uh, vegetations, uh, vegetation over time. Uh, so forests can be wiped out by this highly acidic rain. It's basically burning, chemically burning these trees. And this is what acid rain can do to a statue. So there's a photo on the left from 1908 and then another photo 60 years later. So you can see all the facial features have literally been melted off by this acid rain. Now this is in Germany and the, the acid that uh, fell from the sky here was from factories and other industrial uh, sites. And that type of acid rain is strong, but not nearly as strong as the kind of acid rain that we get when I'm doing a big volcano expedition. It's so strong that the gases are, are everywhere. So we have to wear these gas masks. And uh, I frequently go down to the bottom of these volcanoes and you can see all that gas in behind me. And when the rain falls through that gas, it gets really, really nasty. And so this is our base camp set up at the top of the volcano. And you'll notice a couple of things here. You see the clouds in the background. Those are coming up from the volcano crater. So you've got the white gases, that's actually water vapor. So it's, it's basically cloud. But that sort of orangish gas, that's sulfur dioxide. And that stuff, you've smelled it before. If you've ever lit a match or smelled anything sort of sulfurous burning, that's what it smells like. And it's so potent that, take a look at our tents. You can see we've got these really heavy duty industrial tarps draped over top of our tents. Because if we don't do that, this is what happens to our tents after about a week of camping out there. It's so acidic and so strong, it dissolves the tents. It immediately starts to rust and tarnish anything that's made out of metal. So this is one of the harshest environments in the world. And we're camped up here doing these volcano expeditions, sometimes for weeks at a time. And uh, this is a geologist, Sarah Hoffritz. She joined us on one of, uh, one of my big expeditions there. And the instrument that she's using here is actually measuring the amount of gas that's coming off of the volcano. So scientists, we can study this and get a pretty good idea of how much gas is coming off the volcano, which way it's blowing, and what communities maybe downwind of these, uh, these gases might be at risk of acid rain. And there's a village on this uh, island that has a real hard time because this acid rain pollutes their drinking water. So it can become a real big problem. So we went in, we're studying the volcano here. I'm measuring how hot the lava is with a thermal imaging camera that uh, measures the temperature of the lava. And it's between 1500 to 1800 degrees, really, really hot. Uh, you wouldn't want to get too close, but if you do get close, you have to wear special protective equipment. Uh, while I'm gathering some samples here, I've got this special protective heat suit, but the acid rain doesn't like metal. And here's what happened to my heat suit when I was out in the acid rain for just a few minutes. You can see where it has completely uh, dissolved all the protective aluminum coating on this suit. The suit protects me from the heat of the lava, but it definitely <laughs> doesn't do so well with the acid rain. And this acid rain here is so strong, it's, it's about as strong as the acid that's in a car battery. So uh, a pH of about 0 0.5 to 1. And that's really high on the uh, acidic scale, or I guess technically low on the pH scale. 
So really, really nasty stuff. And it burns your eyes and it stings your skin. And uh, so in terms of acid rain, we're doing a really good job of filtering a lot of this stuff out from our factories and things like that. Acid rain from industrial sources is not nearly as bad as it used to be 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But if you happen to be downwind of a volcano and it's raining through that volcanic uh, uh, gas, this is the kind of thing that you can expect. It is not pleasant at all. Let's put it that way. And you can taste it too. If you're in the rain, you can taste it. It's just disgusting. So on to weird weather number two. This is more of an optical phenomenon. Something called a crown flash. And I didn't even know about this one until maybe last year. And it is bizarre. So I want to show you a video here. Check this out. So I apologize. This is not my video. It's a little bit shaky. But it looks like a searchlight or some kind of beacon coming out of the top of this storm cloud. You can obviously see the sun over on the right. But then what's going on over here? And why is it moving around so much? Like that is bizarre. It almost looks like I don't know, someone's up there with a gigantic spotlight and they're waving it around, right? So what on earth could possibly cause something like this? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. It has to do with how cold it is as you go higher up in the atmosphere. If you've ever uh, climbed a mountain, you know that the higher up you go in the atmosphere, the colder it gets, right? That's why when you're at the top of Mount Everest, it's freezing cold all the time. Well, because it's so cold at these high altitudes, you get a lot of ice crystals in the atmosphere. And the ice crystals can act like a bit of a prism and, uh, and sort of divide light into its component colors and such. And so you get these reflections and refractions of sunlight through these ice crystals. And an interesting thing happens. Because it's a thunderstorm, you've got lightning that happens inside the thunderstorm. And what is lightning? Lightning is basically static electricity. If you've ever rubbed your feet on the carpet and touched a doorknob, you know that spark that happens. So all these ice crystals rubbing together create a static electrical charge. And that electrical charge can align these ice crystals in a certain way that cause these pillars that then reflect sunlight through them. And as the electrical charge moves and changes in the cloud as lightning bolts happen inside the clouds that electrical electromagnetic field will shift and change and that's what causes the beam of light to move around sort of as if someone is moving a spotlight around so it's these reflections from the sun through ice crystals that are moving because of the effects of the magnetic electromagnetic field from lightning it's so crazy and it's very very rare and so the effect is kind of similar to if you rub a balloon against your head, you know how a balloon can pick up little bits of paper. That's the static charge attracting these little bits of confetti or paper. And the same thing is happening above these thunderstorms. It's the same thing that happens if your cat walks through a bunch of packing peanuts, right? It's really the same sort of thing. These, uh, these packing peanuts are aligning themselves so that they're stuck up against the side of your cat. Well, the exact same thing is happening, but with ice crystals, way at the top of these thunderstorms. So that is really cool. So if you ever see these, these towering clouds in the distance, especially if the sun is low, keep an eye out for this uh, crown flash dancing around at the top of a thunderstorm. Super, super cool. So can it rain fish from the sky? Well, yes. Yes, it can. Um, but not like this. So there have been reported uh, incidents of all kinds of weird things falling from the sky, more than just rain, snow, sleet, hail. There have been reports of fish. There have been reports of frogs, tadpoles, even reports of crabs falling from the sky during a rainstorm. And there is an actual explanation for this very rare phenomenon. Now, what we're seeing here in this picture was widely distributed around the internet saying that these fish fell from the sky, but they didn't. This is actually a photo from China after a truck crashed that was carrying a whole bunch of fish. So be careful what you read on the internet. Not all of it is true. Do, uh, do some research in there. This is uh, sort of an exaggeration. A lot of people thought this was real, but it does happen. It is a phenomenon that can happen. 
And there's a place in Honduras called Yoro where they have this raining fish phenomenon that happens at least once a year since the 1800s. They actually have a name for it, the Luvia de Peches, the rain of fish. So what could cause fish to fall from the sky? They have to get up there in the first place, right? Fish don't live in the sky. They're not birds, even though there are flying fish, but those don't count. Uh, so we need some kind of way to get those fish from these lakes, from the oceans, from these rivers, up into the sky. And there's really only one way that that can happen. And that's when you have a water spout. So water spouts are basically tornadoes that form over water. There's different mechanisms that, uh, different ways that water spouts can form, but basically think of them as a tornado over water. And whenever you have a tornado, you have these very strong winds, uh, this updraft, the, uh, the, the the air wants to go up and rotate into this tornado or into this water spout. And if it's passing over water where there happens to be a population of fish or, or crabs or frogs, whatever, they're light enough that they could actually be sucked up like a vacuum cleaner up into the storm. And then as the storm moves on land, those fish can then fall out of the sky. Now, this does not happen very often but it does happen. And I've got a video here to show you kind of, to give you an idea of how powerful these things can be. So this is a, a video, I believe it's from Italy. And you can see the very bottom of this water spout, sort of where the water spout is touching the water. And it's starting to come ashore. And there's a bunch of people out there watching it, which is not the smartest idea because they're about to get run over by this thing. But as it comes ashore, you can really start to see, because it's picking up all this dust and debris. And, and, and these objects are getting sucked up into the sky, these branches and various other uh, you know, parts of trees. Right? And those tree branches, they weigh a lot more than a frog or a fish. So from just seeing how a water spout can be strong enough to, <laughs> to, to vacuum up these various small items, it's not hard to uh, imagine those things then being dropped onto unsuspecting people who wonder why uh, fish are falling from the skies, right? So it is absolutely a thing. And Hollywood has really latched on to this idea. <laughs> they took this idea of small fish being sucked up by a, a water spout and they amplified it to the most extreme degree, of course, with the, the Sharknado movie, right? So this whole Sharknado phenomena is based on the idea that tornadoes can be strong enough to, to vacuum up these fish and launch them on land. They just, you know, made it ridiculous. And then they did it again with Sharknado 2. And then they did it again with Sharknado 3, because people seem to like these Sharknado movies. Oh, and then they did it again with Sharknado 4, and then Sharknado 5, and wait, wait for it. Yep, you guessed it, Sharknado 6. They made six of these movies all based on this really rare weather phenomenon that is so bizarre. I get a kick out of that. I've only seen the very first one. I'm not wasting so much of my life to actually watch all six Sharknado movies. <laughs> I've got one more bizarre weather phenomenon for you today before we switch over to the quiz and some Q&A. And it has to do with how fire can create weather. We know that weather can create fires. You can have lightning bolts that strike uh, a dry forest. And the heat from that lightning, which burns five times hotter than the surface of the sun, can spark a fire. Well, the fires can then also create weather. And I'll show you how. So this photo was from a fire that I was uh, filming in Australia. And uh, I can prove that it was from Australia because there's a kangaroo fleeing from one of these, uh, these fires. And this fire was so big. It was the biggest fire in the Adelaide, Australia area in 35 years. And so we had these towering plumes of smoke that would go very high in the atmosphere. And that, because that warm air wants to rise, it goes up into the atmosphere, and if you remember from earlier, the higher you up you go in the atmosphere, the colder it gets, right? So that rising air goes up into the cold air, 
where it cools and all of the moisture that's in that air, all of the water vapor, the humidity, uh, it condenses and forms clouds. And those clouds can actually turn into storm clouds if the fire is strong enough. So here you can see you've got that plume of smoke, that plume cools as it gets higher into the atmosphere, it forms these clouds. And then if it's big enough, it can actually turn into a thunderstorm cloud. And that thunderstorm cloud can then produce lightning, which can produce even more fires. So that's uh, one of these big problems. And we've been seeing a lot of these fires in the past two years in places like California and Oregon and Alberta and British Columbia all over and Australia, of course, as well. So you can see how this cycle can be self-perpetuating. You've got all of this, uh, this fire that creates a storm, that creates lightning, which then produces more fires. But things can get even weirder than that. What if the thunderstorm that is created by this uh, fire is so strong that it produces a tornado? Well, that is weird and rare, but it does happen. So you can actually get these tornadoes that form in these, we call them pyrocumulonimbus clouds. That's our new word for the day, pyrocumulonimbus. Pyro meaning fire. Cumulonimbus is uh, the, the, the word that we use to describe a thunderstorm cloud. And sometimes if the winds are just right and the storm rotates, you can actually have a tornado forming in that storm that was produced by the fire. And I've got a video here to show you what that looks like, and it's frightening. So this is from California last year. And there you can see the embers of the fire. The fire truck is there, and you can see this tornado spinning in the smoke. And these can be really powerful tornadoes that can uh, rip trees out of the ground. These... <laughs> This trailer could rip flaming trees out of the ground and launch them hundreds of yards or hundreds of meters and spread that fire even further. So yeah, it gets pretty crazy out there with some of these bizarre and unusual uh, weather phenomena. So uh, yeah, I wanna make sure that we have lots of time for questions and stuff and, and this quiz. So I don't wanna go into too much detail, but I can go on and on for days about this kind of stuff. I love it so very much. But uh, there's just, just four examples of some of the weirdest weather phenomena out there. And we've only really scratched the surface. There are uh, hmm. so, so many other kinds of weird weather. You can have snow that rolls downhill and turns into these donuts. You can have, um, uh, you can have upside down rainbows in the sky, but maybe we'll save those for another presentation in the future. We'll have to bring you back in October. I'm really excited. The searchlight thing's still the weirdest to me. I've seen like everything else. I've seen variations of, I guess, and super super cool. But that is a weirdest. I, I had no idea that existed. That was the crown weird. flash. Yeah, it's yeah. so visually bizarre because it looks like something that should not Maybe exist in cloud. nature. Yeah. No, freaky. Anyway, George, that was awesome. Thank you so, so much for such a wicked tour. And as you said, we want to make sure there's time for quizzes and tons of questions today. So what I'm going to do is go full screen myself, bring up our new game pin. Something went very odd with Kahoot. The world's weirdest weather affected the Kahoot as well. So new game pin for this one today, uh, 324-9990. I'll bring that up on my screen so you guys can get ready and play along. So if you have your own devices, great. If you're joining in at home, that works perfectly fine as well. And if you don't want to do Kahoot at all and you just want to... Uh, share these questions with your class. Uh, please do join us. This is very exciting, guys. And so, George, what you can do is when we get to like the final second or so of each countdown, you can give us like a hint with all these questions. But four Ooh. quick questions, guys. There's no prize, but you do get both George and I's everlasting respect. So Glory for the winner. Yeah. Perfect. All right. 50. Oh, look at all these people logging in. That's amazing. I know. It's great. See, the, the glitch was that it was up to 2,000 and it just kept repeating the same name. So who knows what was happening there? Uh, but let's dive in. This is awesome. Let's try and beat that record. We're going to beat the record. Okay. We're I don't know about beat. that, but I hope so. I'm, I'm... We, we're getting there. This is pretty great. You guys are awesome. We are what was the record, to... Jesse? 250? 250. We're like 250. there. Oh, my we're God. Gonna... We're going to smash it. We're going to smash it. We're I'm going to get the other way. <laughs> keep, keep, you can keep joining. Keep joining, everybody. Keep joining, we're, guys. World's Weird we Weather this. with George Cruz. Here we go. Our first question. We smashed the record. Yes. I hope you guys uh, followed along in that last little bit. Fire tornadoes, a real and terrifying thing. We just had this. You have eight seconds. 
True or false? What do we think? I don't know if we need a clue on this one, uh, Jesse. I mean, there's the picture there as well. <laughs> so I'm very much open. What do we got? Oh, so you know, you got it. Most of you got that right. A few of you weren't sure, even with the video. Okay, that's totally good. There's that's actually two cool. kinds of fire tornadoes. There Ooh. are fire whirls and there are actual fire tornadoes, which we talked about today. Yes. That's crazy. <laughs> Ooh, the largest this, but the largest temperature shift in one hour ever on this planet was how much? So I got it in Fahrenheit and Celsius for our American and Canadian friends. What do we think? Is it 45 Fahrenheit, 10 Fahrenheit, 200 Fahrenheit, 20 Fahrenheit with uh, Celsius beside it? One more second. George, do you know this one? I looked this up before. It is well, A. I think it's, yeah, A. Okay, so this was likely, do you, do you know the story behind this? So when I looked it up, they were talking about Texas, and I don't know why specifically, but can you tell us? <laughs> okay, so this was likely from a nocturnal heat burst. Okay. Which, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is, come on, tell me. Okay, so okay. whenever you compress a gas, yeah. it heats up, right? So if you're filling a scuba tank, if you, if you feel the tank, it actually gets warm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a, is it Boyle's Law? I can't remember off the top of my head. So sometimes you can get this descending air that comes down out of the sky and yeah. as it hits the ground, it compresses and that compressing air will yeah. actually heat up in a very unusual and sudden manner. I like it. Nocturnal heat burst. There's your unexpected weather. And they usually happen at night. Nocturnal. Okay. Next question. We got a scoreboard. The, oh, no. Prairie Dog is now winning. Okay. Prairie Dog. And if you keep winning, let us know who you are at the end. Scientists fly planes straight into big hurricanes to understand and track them. True or false? Oh, I don't know. That sounds pretty uh, dangerous. That's crazy. I don't think, I, I don't know. I've seen I don't know. Do we even have planes that could survive a hurricane? One what more kind second. of pilot would be crazy enough to fly yeah. into a hurricane? True. It is, in fact, true. In fact, we featured scientists that do exactly this on our broadcast. Oh, it's trying to register. There's so many of you answering. So, exact, pretty much dead half. And by the way, we've crushed our record but true is the actual answer way to go guys okay, okay hold on before you go to the next question not yeah, only no, is I, it true i have yeah. done this so i have flown with the uh the united states air force reserve hurricane hunters hmm. it was into the eye of hurricane ike back in 2008 as it was coming off of cuba and what we did is we flew from biloxi mississippi out into the gulf of mexico flew into the eye of the storm and then flew back and forth within the eye a bunch of times. Yeah. And what they do is they, they have a radar uh, system on there and they have these devices called drop sons. And it's like a giant tube yeah. that they shoot out of the plane and it has a little parachute. And as it drops down through the storm, it measures things like temperature and uh, barometric pressure and all of these different uh, uh, meteorological measurements. Yeah. And that gives them a really good idea as to how strong the hurricane is, what the winds are doing, which way is it moving. And then they take that data and they give it to the National Hurricane Center in Florida. And they use that to help with the, the prediction of where they think the hurricane is gonna go and how strong the hurricane is gonna be. So not only do these guys do it, they do it all the time. There are flights going out today, I believe, out to Hurricane Sam that's out in the Atlantic and it helps to save lives. George, it's almost like I added this question for a reason, hoping that you'd tell that story. <laughs> All right, final question, folks. George's favorite thing to do is sit and relax on a beach. The picture might give it away, and maybe the presentation. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Six more seconds. Hmm. <laughs> We're crushing records here. One more second. All right. The answer is not even a little. No, no. George is, is hanging out in Darvaza Crater there. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Who is these? 376 people that just watched my presentation I thought I'd like to I sit on the beach. I think I they're trolling us, Jesse. They're trolling so. us. There's a lot of trolling going on. All so right. That, let me just, if I may. Please. That picture that you posted up. Yes. Uh, that was from an expedition that I did in Turkmenistan for National Geographic, where there is a burning pit of fire that's been on, uh, it's been burning for about 50 years. And I was the only person to have ever gone down inside, gathered soil samples, and we were looking for bacteria down there. I'm going to bring up the name of it, uh, I guess, I guess Darvaza Gra Gas Craters. I, I Darvaza. Guess, right? There we go. So people can look that up. You can see it in George's website. I know a few of you checked that out before the broadcast. So, George, uh, Daring Echidna is our winner. If you're in YouTube chat, you want to let us know who Daring Who's Echidna is. Who's our winner? Daring Echidna. Daring Echidna. Oh, that's daring a great Echidna name. Daring Echidna today. It's a very good name. Wait, is, it, actually, is it a person or is it actually a Daring Echidna that was... We don't know. That's to be decided. We'll find out. If we have a sentient Echidna that's playing the broadcast, all the better. We'll have to feature them on a broadcast soon. 
Okay, um, and how many players? How many players? I need to know the number. We had like 700 players. What? No. That's what it looked like. I don't, it, it seems crazy. That was like over 700, it looks like. I'll get you the stats later. It was the biggest by far. Like, so there you go. Crush the record. Crush the record. Crush the record. The well, you guys are the on that note, let's dive in with questions. we got a bunch of live classes, a few folks joining us on YouTube as well. Uh, I want to go to Avica West. I'm Ms. Michael's class, grade fours. If you want to unmute your mic and come on in for the first question, you are good to go, guys. Hi, welcome in. Hey. There we Hi. go. Now we've got unmuted. Okay, I've got Jenna. Coming up with a question. Yeah, did you ever get? You have to go down so you can see. There did you, you ever get injured of any of these um, dangerous like stuff? Right. Thank you very much for uh, for you know caring about my well being. I like that. And uh, the answer to that is no. I take safety very uh, seriously, and never once have I ever been injured. Not a single broken bone. I've never had to stay overnight in a hospital from any of my expeditions. I've gotten sick from traveling a bunch of times, and I've had a few minor scrapes and burns and stuff, but nothing serious. Thank you for asking. We always get that question, and I like it every single time. By the way, before we go to Madame Beauchamp's class, uh, uh, Jalen, Regent Park Public School, was our daring echidna today. So way to go, Mr. Rutledge's class. That's our winner. It was not a sentient echidna, sadly. In Regent uh, Park, awesome. Regent Park, Just down the road. Yeah. Um, all right, Madame Beauchamp's class. They're joining us in Sudbury today, four fives. So your devices are off right now, but if you are, want to turn on your camera or mic, I can take your question. If not, I can come back in a second. There we are. Hi. Hi. How are you? Great. Good. Um, my grade four or fives are saying they don't have any questions. <laughs> You're muted. No questions? Well, we'll have no. to go back. We'll see if they get one in a minute. George, you, were too, you, you covered it all. I want to know if anyone in that classroom would join me on one of these expeditions. That's what I want. <laughs> what do we think? Yeah, I just finally got one. Okay. What is your favorite weird weather? Ooh. No pressure. So, this is, uh, my favorite weird weather is the one I haven't experienced yet. And there's a phenomenon called red sprites. And it, it's these bursts of energy that come out of the tops of thunderstorms. And they look like red jellyfish, but they reach almost into space. And they're really hard to see. You have to be hundreds of miles away from the storm to see them because they they go so high. And I have yet to photograph one of these yet. If you check out the Thunder and Lightning presentation that George did with us, you'll see pictures of these. the weirdest, spaciest things you've ever seen. Like, I, honestly, it so looks bizarre. ridiculous. It's amazing. Yeah. doesn't Very look real. All right, Miss Little's class, uh, grade six. You guys are joining us today in Dutton, Ontario. Welcome in, guys, and come on in. Yeah, go ahead. What made you inspired to chase storms? How did I get inspired? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I love science. I love nature. And I love learning. And so I was able to combine all of those things together with my love of travel and my interest in photography and videography. And I started chasing storms when I was in my 20s, in my late 20s and uh, photographing first locally here in Toronto, the storms that come through. And then I did my first tornado chase back in 1998 in Oklahoma, where they get lots of tornadoes in Oklahoma and Kansas. And that really got me interested in doing more. As I was doing that, I was also working in a recording studio here in Toronto. That was my job. I'm an engineer by trade, but I was doing so much of it because I loved it so much and was enjoying it so much that I got this reputation and I eventually landed my own TV show and that just <laughs> snowballed into the next thing and the next thing. So it was really my interest in science, my interest in nature and my interest in showcasing these amazing parts of the world that very few people ever get to see. I love that you mentioned that you started this in your late twenties too. So I think when we have a lot of classes on, the assumption is that people start from like 10 years old, you have a passion when you're four and that's just all you do. And you go in a straight path to it. And I mean, you were 28, right? When you did your first thing. I that's think. right. Yeah. I was, yeah. 20, I, I, I was on my, yeah, I was 20. Yeah, exactly. 28 years old. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but I always had that interest from when right. I was young. Right. It, it just sort of, it was there. And then my attention shifted to music for quite a few years. <laughs> which is also still there. But then when I got into my 20s, it really just expanded and blossomed. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's just a nice lesson for anyone. Like, whatever your hobbies, you know, keep those up, follow your passions. Even if you can't do it for a day job right from the get-go, it's something that could ultimately, you know, turn into something like George, uh, which is a pretty exciting career path. You're never too old, you're never too young. Fantastic. 
Um, this Forsyth class, Breeze Bridge, grade nine, come on in and take us away. Um, have you guys ever, uh, have you ever used remote sensing to track a uh, weather phenomenon? Remote sensing to track weather phenomena. Yeah, all the time, all the time. So remote sensing is basically using instruments that are elsewhere that are that have sensors on them that allow you to get that data to study something. So, I mean, that's really vague, but we can use remote sensing to study earthquakes. We can use remote sensing to study populations growth and urban sprawl. So satellites are our best tool, certainly my best tool for remote sensing. And there are different types of satellites out there that use different types of sensors for tracking hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that. And these weather satellites, typically they're, they're what we call geostationary satellites. So you've got some satellites that orbit the earth, right? Like, uh, like communication satellites and, or not, no, not communication satellites, like a spy satellite, right? Will we'll orbit the Earth and it's taking photos of the Earth, like these Google satellites and things like that. But there are geostationary satellites that stay in one place. And as the Earth rotates, the, the satellite rotates with it. And it stays in one spot. And that's really useful because if the satellite is in one spot, then we can always get data from that same area. So for example, the Atlantic Ocean. There's a, a geostationary weather satellite above the Atlantic Ocean that right now is taking photographs, visual photographs, infrared photographs, uh, all kinds of false color imagery from various wavelengths that we can use to study these hurricanes and, uh, and tornadoes and forest fires, all kinds of different things, but uh, certainly for, for hurricanes all the time, all the time looking at this stuff. Yeah, very, very cool. I'm, I'm glad we got that question. That was neat. Uh, I want to highlight, too, with Space Month coming up in October, uh, many of you may have seen satellites. If you go out at night, you'll quite often see satellites going across the sky. You can look at the ISS, which is one of my favorite things to ever do. You can look up anywhere you are in the world and find out when the International Space Station, with astronauts on it, is going to pass overhead. You can watch it and know that there are people up there, which is one of the coolest, like, uh, I guess, little things that anyone can do anytime, any day. So I encourage you guys all to check yeah. it out. That you got to look really closely to see it, though. It only takes like a minute and a half to pass the sky oh, above you. And, and it's big. It's so bright compared to others. Anyway, very, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to end of ourselves. Miss Langer's class, Cobra, come on in, guys, and then we'll do a whole other round of questions. We're ripping through these. So come on up and take us away. Hi, my name is Ella. How many volcanoes have you studied? to study the weather and what about the volcano in spain now oh great question great question so oof, i'm looking at my map right now and i'm gonna guess i've probably been to 25 or 30 volcanoes all over the world from uh from as far south as as uh, antarctica the deception island is a volcano in antarctica that i've been to a number of times to iceland italy indonesia tonga vanuatu congo ethiopia Peru, Guatemala, Hawaii, all over the world. And um, everyone is different. They all have their own different types of uh, activity. They have their own sort of personalities. Some of them explode with these huge eruptions of uh, ash and, uh, <coughs> pardon me, ash and rock that can go, you know, travel halfway around the world or all the way around the world in the upper atmosphere. The ones I really love are the ones that have the flowing lava. We call those effusive volcanoes as opposed to explosive. Effusive just means it's flowing. And for example, the volcano on uh, La Palma Island right now in uh, the Canary Islands, which is part of Spain, is having this amazing eruption right now. Oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> so this volcano, a, a crack formed on the side. And remember earlier, I was talking about this volcanic gas and that volcanic gas is in the lava and that gas is coming to the surface and it's pushing the lava out and it's forming these fountains of lava think of it like like you've got a bottle of soda you got a coke bottle and you put your thumb on the top and you shake it all of the carbon dioxide in that bottle now wants to expand and come out and if you move your thumb you can you know you can spray it at your friends well the same thing is happening but with liquid rock and volcanic gases there in spain and so now all this very fluid lava is shooting out and then it's pouring downhill. And unfortunately, it's destroyed 
several hundred uh, structures and homes, um, but it's doing it very slowly. So if people are able to get out of the, the way of it. It's not very dangerous, but it is very destructive. And just yesterday or the day before, that lava reached the Atlantic Ocean. And when it reached the ocean, it actually continued out into the ocean. And it's doing that right now as we speak. And it's created this, what we call a delta of lava. So the island of La Palma has gotten bigger just in the past two days because this new rock has hit the ocean, cooled, and expanded the size of the island. And that's how a lot of these islands form from the very beginning. So we've got some really cool processes going on right now. We, we're, we're watching, literally watching an island get bigger in front of our very eyes. How cool is that? It's so cool. And because you've done so many programs, it's been nice for me to see when like a hurricane's making landfall. People ask questions about that. We've got these volcanoes happening right now. And, and so uh, great question, guys. Thanks for, for looking into the news before you came to today's broadcast. Uh, George, do you have time for another round of questions with everybody? Of course. Yeah, beautiful. All right. Well, let's go back to Avoca West in Glenview, Illinois. Uh, unmute your mic. This is Michael Cross and take us away, guys. Yes, everyone gets two today. It's very exciting. We've got... We've got Lulu coming up here. Go ahead, go down where you can see. There you go. Um, why does a volcano have gas in it? Be louder, Lulu. I don't think he can hear you. I got it. Why does a volcano have gas in it? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So deep inside the earth, we have all these different we have all these different elements, right? We've got carbon and we've got iron and we've got nickel and we've got all, all these different things that are you know, hydrogen and all this stuff that's, that's deep inside the rock. And the, the, the core of the earth is very hot. Some of that material, some of that rock gets molten. And some of those things end up in the molten lava, right? So while it's deep underground, it's just sitting there, kind of like the Coke bottle with the lid on it. And it's only when you get the chance for that to break through the surface, it releases that pressure. And now the elements that were melted and dissolved away in that liquid rock deep in the Earth's crust now have the opportunity to expand. So gases can be compressed and they can expand, but solids and liquids don't. You can't compress water, right? So the, the gaseous portion of that, those elements deep inside the Earth that are blended in with all of that liquid rock, it's only those gas portions that then have the opportunity to expand. And when they expand, sometimes they expand violently, and that's what causes these explosions of these volcanoes. That's what causes this lava to, to shoot out of the ground, like what's happening in the Canary Islands right now. So it's basically just the Earth's way of recycling materials. There are places where you've got one tectonic plate that's diving down underneath another one. And as that's happening, that part of the Earth's crust is being recycled down into the Earth. So all of the rock and all of the material that was once at the Earth's surface is being plunged down into the Earth where it gets heated up, gets uh, liquefied, and then the gaseous parts of that then eventually will come out at some point, maybe millions of years later. <laughs> as a volcanic eruption. It really is a dynamic earth that we live on. If you were to shrink the earth down to the size of an apple, the crust that we live on would only be as thick as the skin on that apple. I've always loved that fact, it's very neat. Lulu, thanks for that great question and for the great hat as well, I love it. Um, let's go back to Sudbury for our group joining at home at Evo Shop. If you wanna take a question from your group, share it with us, go right ahead. Hi, um, I think uh, George has inspired a few of my uh, my scientists in my class they want I'm to know new, madam. they want to know um how um, I'm new. some questions the heckling from students on google hangouts oh, I missed it so much from last year they just told me i was muted but i think i'm gonna You're have fun for us okay. yes i can hear you um they want to know how to become a storm teacher uh chaser they want your job my right. students want your job well there's no school to go to uh there's no university program so I basically had to learn this on my own. So it, one thing that would be really beneficial would be to study one of the sciences, particularly meteorology. So uh, that would probably be my best suggestion. Although you don't have to be a meteorologist to be a storm chaser. You just have to be passionate. You have to be able to learn how to forecast the weather. And there are lots of resources online that can teach you how to do that. 
and then you basically have to go out there and and do it but do it as safely as possible because it can be dangerous and if you don't know what you're doing one of two things will happen you will either miss the storm entirely because you don't know where to go or you might put yourself in a very dangerous position and so uh, education is the most important tool that I have had in my journey to become a storm chaser. And most of that I either learned myself or I, well, I learned myself. I learned from reading, I learned from the internet, and I learned from some other more experienced storm chasers that had decades more experience than me. And they were uh, mentors for me as I was getting into it. So that was a really good resource. Yeah. Fantastic, guys. We always get that question for you, of course, George, and I, I appreciate answering it every single time. It's certainly a pretty inspiring career story and then what neat stuff you get to do. Um, let's head to Miss Little's class. we got three more questions coming up. Come on back in and uh, take us away, guys. What was the scariest weather you have seen? Ooh. Scariest weather I have seen. Uh, I chased the Guinness World Record largest tornado on Earth. And that was in 2013 in El Reno, Oklahoma. And this was a, a very scary, very scary tornado. It was so big. Uh, let me think here. It was 2.6 miles wide. So 4.3 kilometers wide. That's how big this thing was. And it did a significant, a lot of, uh, you know, did a lot of damage. It was throwing cars all over the place and it was really scary. Um, that, and being in the middle of Hurricane Katrina when it made landfall, that was scary as well because the entire town around me was being ripped to shreds. And you couldn't see anything because the rain was just so intense. You could just hear the town coming apart. Very scary. Yeah. We featured both of those things in past broadcasts with you. So, again, if people want right. to check out our YouTube channel and see those, uh, it is. It's scary stuff. The Katrina footage is, is weird and freaky. And, and so, it, like, I mean, with the giant tornadoes too, you've done many programs on tornadoes. So to see something that that is that scale or one of the more powerful ones like F4, F5 tornadoes and what they can do to structures is astonishing. I mean, the house is just gone. It, gone. Just, it, it disintegrates like nothing. What What's the wind speed inside an F4 tornado or F5? Like, uh, over 250 miles an hour plus. Yeah. So yeah. The, uh, winds that strong act more like a solid than, than wind. Mm -hmm. And it will take a well-built house and sweep it off its foundation and throw the pieces hundreds of meters down into the next neighborhood. Yeah, yeah wow. very dangerous well, stuff. Again, highlighting the importance of safety. You talked about this, our first question, have you ever been injured? So when you are doing this sort of work, you take such precaution to make sure you're never in a situation where you're likely to be harmed or mitigate that risk as much as possible. I think that's Touch wood. Important. Yeah. Very safe. Miss <laughs> um, Forsyth, come on back in and we'll wrap up with Miss Langer's class in a minute. Come on in, guys. What is the most recent storm you've chased? The most recent storm? Well, because of COVID, I've kind of been uh, limited in what I can do. Uh, international travel is a lot more difficult right now. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to be able to work with the kind of types of people that I normally work with, like television crews and things like that. So the past while has been real, real challenging, although it's been a very busy storm season here in Ontario. And I, I think I saw you were from Muskoka. So up in that region, there's been a lot of storms this year. So I've been chasing a lot of these local storms. And there's been a lot of them that have been coming in from Michigan across Lake Huron and then coming into southern Ontario. And we've had actually quite a few tornadoes by uh, Ontario standards uh, so far this year. So, yeah, I've been chasing from home as much as I can. But uh, getting ready to head back out there, I've got some some plans for 2020, 20, sorry, 2022. I've lost track of what year it is. All of us have. What year is it? What decade? Who knows anymore? <laughs> um, but very, very cool. You highlighted this in a slide at the very end. If people want to check out your site, furiousearth.com, so many great things. You can follow George's adventures, see pictures, stories, all sorts of great stuff from there. I really encourage you guys to check that out because we really did barely scratch the surface of some of the things he's had the chance to do today. Uh, George, one last question coming in from Miss Langer's group. Come on in, guys, and uh, take us away. Um, why are there different types of tornadoes like E1, E2, E3, E4, and E5 tornadoes? Right. Excellent question. So what we're talking about, the E, uh, so let me rewind here. We categorize tornadoes based on how strong they are, how, how high the wind speeds are. So the scale that we use is called the EF scale, Enhanced Fujita Scale. Fujita, is, it's the name of a, a, a researcher... Ted Fujita, who invented this, this scale that we use to measure tornadoes. 
So a tornado that's very weak, that doesn't do a lot of damage, we would call that an EF0 tornado. Uh, you get into the EF1, EF2, those are tornadoes that might, might rip the roof off your house, but it wouldn't completely destroy your house. When you get up to the EF3, EF4 range, those are very destructive uh, tornadoes that can destroy an entire house, pick up a car and throw it great distances. When you get up to the top of the scale, these EF5 tornadoes, they are extremely rare. There's maybe one of those every year, maybe one every two years. They're really, really rare. And those are so strong that they can take, as we mentioned earlier, a well-built house, completely sweep it off its foundation, leaving nothing left but the concrete slab. So we, we classify these tornadoes by how strong the winds are. But we don't know how strong the winds are while the tornado is happening because they happen so quickly. A tornado could touch down, last only maybe 30 minutes, and then it's gone. So there's, it's very difficult to measure these wind speeds. So what we do is we look at what damage was caused. And we know that we can send engineers in and study the damage. And they know, OK, this, this house was constructed this way, and it was damaged this badly. Therefore, the wind speeds were about this strong. So it's a forensic analysis, kind of like a crime, it's like CSI, right? It's like this crime scene investigation where these experts go in and they look at the damage and then they try to determine how strong the wind speeds are. And then they give it an EF number based on what they've found. Great question, guys. I think we get that one almost every time, which is so much fun. George, it's a great question. Uh, Every other broadcast, I like deliberately try and cap it at 45 minutes and you, I could just let you talk all day, but we are getting near the end of period. So I know some of our class friends have to go on to the next session, which is too bad. Like there's nothing you're going to do in your day that was as cool as the world's weirdest weather at George. So, <laughs> sorry, math lesson just out the window. Um, although you can probably track tornadoes with calculus if you want. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I really encourage you to check out furiousearth.com. Some amazing stuff there. Check out George's past presentations on our YouTube channel. And as you know, George, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our friends to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Madame Beauchamp, Avoca West, this little middle, 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 middle